Chapter 1 My family tree runs from the birth of Henry R. Blaster in 1580, down 20 generations to Grayson and Claire R. Blaster, my son Peter and uh, daughter-in-law Aaron's children, uh, five years and three years old, respectively. What follows are a number of slides uh, documenting the more recent background in this history and more particularly my life. This is a fragment of a certificate given to my then 13-year-old grandfather, Samuel R. Blaster, apparently given to him by the Department of Science away as to why they'd be handing out freehand drawing certificates is a puzzle to me, but there it is. This is a certificate uh, evidencing that my uh, grandfather Samuel R. Blaster was appointed the Justice of the Peace for the County of Stafford. Uh, it, it notes that he was the chairman of the Brown Hills Urban District Council. That sounds like fun. Uh, and I expect he, he became just the of the peace ex officio that office. Basically, the previous JP had uh, died or otherwise been incapacitated, and he was filling in a hole until a permanent appointment could be made. This is a microfilm copy of a passenger list for the port of Halifax. If you could see the original, you'd see that my grandfather Samuel Arblaster was listed, and also, as we'll see, uh, the, the rest of his family at that time. They sailed on the SS Mongolian uh, from Liverpool to Halifax, and as you'll see, they eventually made their way to Quebec City. This is the SS Mongolian. It was a single-engine ship, but it also had two masts that were rigged for sails if the wind was blowing in the right direction. Uh, it was uh, sunk by a German submarine in uh, the summer of 1918 off the uh, coast of England. This is an excerpt of a 57-year uh, list of passengers who arrived at the port of Quebec City. I assume that it was the SS Mongolian that brought my uh, grandfather's family there, but I'm only guessing. You'll see his name listed. Uh, uh, my grandmother's name, Louise, her uh, maiden name was Jones, as I recall, and there are six children. You won't see my father's name on that list, Robert, because he was not to be born for another decade. This is the cover page of a compilation of the roles of officers and uh, men of the number three siege battery of the Canadian Expeditionary Force. The date of this was uh, December 18, 1915, and it indicates they're embarking from St. John's, New Brunswick. I assume that's to go to Europe. Amongst the members of the number three siege battery was my uncle Victor. You'll see his name uh, second from the bottom. He's uh, his rank was Gunner, and you'll see uh, his next of kin was my grandfather Samuel, who lived in Montreal. The um, date he was, he signed up was October 12, 1915. This is a photograph of my uncle Ted Rockcliffe and my aunt Ivy. Uh, her maiden name was Arblaster. Uh, it indicates on the back of the photo that uh, it was taken at um, home, somebody's home, or Great, Ho it looks like Hogwood, Stafford, England. He was, uh, when he retired uh, in the late uh, 50s, early 60s, uh, he was a senior manager at Bell Canada in Montreal. My aunt was a housewife, as far as I know, all her life. Uh, they were great uh, golfing fanatics, and they could actually walk to a golf course from where they lived on St. Mary's Drive. This is a notice that was published in uh, an official Quebec publication uh, that serves as the vehicle to bring to the attention of the public in an official way uh, uh, certain facts. 
in this case the incorporation of our blaster bakeries comma limited you'll see the incorporators are uh, a lawyer and a couple of secretaries that was the way it, corporations were set up back in the day and in many cases today you you it's an in-office incorporation but the uh, uh, control ownership of the business passes on to the client in this case Samuel Arblaster so this was a corporation to take over his bakery business to explain when he came over to Canada in 1910 before then he was a baker in uh, his neck of the woods in Staffordshire and uh, he carried on that trade uh, when he arrived here in Canada uh, my aunt Ivy told me that uh, his business ran into trouble as a result of the depression uh, because um, his clients included large uh, operations, restaurants, private clubs, this sort of thing, and people, unsurprisingly, weren't paying the bills. And uh, I don't know if this incorporation was to protect him or what, but for some reason he decided to incorporate, which would shield him from uh, creditors. Today, the uh, maximum capitalization of a company can be anything you want to make it. But I think back in this day, the capitalization generally tried to uh, track the value of the company, um, exclusive of or inclusive of debt, as the case may be. And in this case, it was twenty thousand uh, dollars. If you adjust for inflation and bring it to twenty year twenty twenty value, it's going to be a lot more than that, obviously. This is my great-grandfather, John F. Donald, and uh, his wife, Jane. Her maiden name is Chalmers, and we'll hear more about that later. It appears to be that they're sitting on the front porch of their house. Uh, the back of the photo indicates it's about 1898. Uh, if so, this would be in the county of Lambton uh, in uh, Plimpton Township. The two toddlers in this photograph, not the one sitting on the uh, hood of the car, which is, by the way, a McLaughlin Buick, but the two sitting in the laps of the two ladies, I think one of those may be my mother, and the man in the seat behind them is, I think, my grandfather, uh, Stuart. Back in the days before the Internet and television and even radio, the only way to uh, get out messages to a wide group of people is you know, through print. And uh, entrepreneurial publishers would send research crews out to uh, regional areas to gather up background and produce for that area this uh, for the county of Lambton in specific. It's a bio biographical uh, record and it would be sold Certainly everybody who's listed in it is going to buy a copy. One of the biographies in this uh, compilation is that of my uh, great-grandfather, John F. Donald. You'll see him listed uh, in the bottom left-hand corner on this uh, index page. He obviously purchased a copy because it was passed down eventually to me. Now, John F. Donald's... Uh, entry and by the way uh, he would have been my um, great-grandfather uh, indicates uh, that uh, he was the skein of John Donald who had come over from Scotland in the early 1800s settled in Lanark, Lanark County and eventually he came to own uh, uh, 300 acres of agricultural land plus he'd been a teacher for 20 years and retired on a pension uh, one of his sons, who would have been my great-great-grandfather, was uh, John Donald. He was born in uh, 1826 uh, in Lanark County, and uh, as an adult, he moved on to Plimpton Township, um, where he came to own, over time, 154 acres of agricultural land, which were... Um, uh, taken over by my great-grandfather, John F. Uh, Donald, uh, the, the uh, self-same person who's in this uh, 
uh, bio, biography or biograph. Uh, he was born in 1860. Um, my great grandfather, John F. Donald, uh, when he owned the 150 acres, they discovered oil on it. And uh, eventually there were, according to this uh, summary, a number of oil wells on the property eventually. So this discusses in more detail the uh, John F. Donald and, and uh, the discovery of the oil wells tells us he was a liberal. It seems to be pretty common. He was married uh, to uh, Jane Chalmers, uh, daughter of Alexander Chalmers, and we'll hear more about the Chalmers as we go through uh, this record. Uh, unfortunately, she died in uh, 1902, leaving uh, her husband, John F. Donald, and three children, William, John, Frank, and Stuart. Stuart was my grandfather. It indicates that in 1904, Mr. Donald remarried, and uh, on it went. He was a member of the Beaver Lodge. The fragment of the paragraph at the uh, bottom of the page is the uh, subject of more detail in the next uh, slide, but it makes reference to Alexander Chalmers, who is in my direct line going north on my uh, maternal side. It contains some detail about his father, who obviously came over to, uh, to uh, Ontario, Canada, uh, very early in the 1800s, and it's kind of intriguing. He was a supporter of the government during the Mackenzie Rebellion of 1837. Alexander, his son, was living in a lonely log cabin in Plimpton Township. The detail on Alexander Chalmers' background is uh, quite remarkable. Uh, I guess it was his grandfather, Robert Chalmers, came over from uh, Scotland in uh, 1821 and settled in Lanark County. It sounds like the story of the Donald line as well. Uh, he had a son, James, born in uh, Lanark County, who, uh, as he moved on in life, moved to Plimpton Township outside of Sarnia. That would be the county of Lambton. And uh, the description of what they went through uh, to settle was pretty remarkable. It's, this describes... Uh, Frequent visitors were wolves, bears, and other wild creatures of the forest. Uh, and uh, on it went. Boy, life was tough back in those days. Alexander Chalmers lived with his uh, father in Plimpton Township until he was a, uh, until he was 20 years old. In 1858, uh, he went out on his own and with some money he'd made through his own efforts, uh, purchased a track of 100, an eight, 100 acres of land. Uh, it included some mortgage financing. But he went on to work that land. He cut timber, timber and uh, cleared up a full 100 acres, uh, which apparently was not an easy idea. Um, part of his uh, farm was is the present site of the village of Wyoming in, uh, in uh, Plimpton Township, uh, through which the Grand Trunk Railway passes. In any event, uh, he married uh, Janet Park in 1861, and uh, together they had a family of uh, seven children, one of whom married John F. Donald, and they had three children, including my grandfather, Stuart. I'm intrigued that the uh, first full paragraph on this slide it talks about Alexander Chalmers having skills in uh, 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 manufacturing furniture. It, it says some of the articles of furniture with dec which decorate his home and are still fulfilling the purposes which, for which they were intended were the product of his own skill and ing ingenuity. I think one of those pieces of furniture is in my son's Peter's basement at the moment. On the Park side of the uh, family tree, I can recall in the 1960s, uh, my family would go down to Sarnia to meet up with um, my mother's uh, sister and their family, the Higgins, uh, and we met 
um, an aunt of my mother's. I can't recall her first name, but her last name was Park. And her son was a, a, a trumpet player in big bands. He, as a sideline, he was also an insurance salesman. She was a very fine painter. So my uh, grandfather's brother, William J. Donald, um, was at one point in time a professor. I'm not sure what he was a professor in, but presumably uh, agricultural pursuits. Uh, he was an advisor to the uh, United States White House on agricultural matters. And as you can see from this letter, his residence was uh, at an apartment building in off Washington Square in New York City. Here he discusses some background uh, regarding the uh, Donald family. I'll leave it to you to pursue it in detail. Apparently, William J. Donald and my mother were uh, kind of trading information on uh, family history. William J. Donald here writes about uh, having uh, met the Chief Justice of the Supreme Court of Canada in Ottawa, and he also uh, met uh, Fred McGregor, who'd been uh, Prime Minister Mackenzie King's secretary for a number of years. So it sounds like he was uh, pretty clued in. Uh, also, it indicates that uh, um, he met with one of his college students. So I guess he was a professor. And it indicates 1913. Here, John F. Donald is uh, referenced as having married Jenny Chalmers. I understood her name was Jane. This listing, also in my mother's handwriting, has a peculiar list I don't understand on the far right side. Uh, there's a heading 1917, and below that, a bunch of numbers. And I can't quite connect those to uh, any other information. This, uh, my mother records that uh, Alexander Chalmers was born August 19th, 1838, and his wife Jeanette, a.k.a. Jane Chalmers, uh, was born August 14th, 1842, both in the township of uh, Plimpton. It's interesting, at the bottom, of the uh, it indicates John F. Donald and his wife Jane E. Donald had four sons, one of them born 1888, just described as infant son. So I suppose he died uh, in childbirth. This uh, note from William J. Donald uh, to my mother records that uh, his daughter has graduated from uh, college and uh, and she's off to the <clears throat> teaching world. Chapter 2. This uh, photograph was taken in the basement of, I believe, my Uncle Jack's home on Bond Street in London. It indicates it's 1949. Uh, on the left is my uh, Uncle Jack. Um, he did not serve in the First World War. Uh, it's kind of funny. Uh, but at the outbreak, whenever it was, 1914, 1915, whenever he was eligible age-wise, uh, he tried to sign up for the Canadian Expeditionary Force, and they turned him down because uh, he was too short. He was a short guy, five foot two, and uh, that wasn't good enough. So, But he was a trier. He came back a year or two later, as I recall, and uh, tried to enlist again, and again he turned him down because he was too short. The man in the middle is my uh, grandfather, Stuart Donald. Uh, I think originally he was a, just a farmer, but uh, for most of his uh, uh, working life, he worked for a large agricultural machinery company. It wasn't Massey Ferguson or Massey Harris, but it was a, a, big, or, a big organization. Unfortunately for him, uh, as he was approaching re retirement at age 65, which was standard back then, uh, he was driving to work early one morning, and, and his car crossed a railway track at an unfortunate time and was struck uh, T-boned by a locomotive, and he was killed, which was unfortunate for him. He'd had his retirement planned out 
he'd purchased uh, 50 acres of land in and around Plimpton Township, and he planned with a farmhouse and barn on it, and he planned on raising Black Angus cattle for beef. The man on the right is my father, uh, Robert Donald, uh, four years away from the uh, Second World War when he was a uh, lance corporal in uh, the Canadian Army, served, uh, he landed at Normandy, but he, you know, he wasn't uh, one of the initial ways. I think he told me one time he was in the 22nd wave of uh, troops uh, landing at Normandy. His, uh, he was associated with um, a communications uh, group. They drove around in radio trucks and stuff like that. This is a true uh, relic of uh, 1940s culture. This is a, a bar uh, in the basement of my Uncle Jack's house on uh, Bond Street. At the beginning of my life, my parents lived uh, in a home in uh, Lambeth, which is uh, which was a suburban, semi-rural area just outside of London, Ontario. This notation in my father's handwriting says, the house that our blasters made. I don't know if that means they had a hand in the construction. I doubt it. He was not a handyman type, or that they, <clears throat> they were the owners and had a general contractor built it. I have no idea, but there it is. We didn't live there la that long. We subsequently moved to Sarnia. This is me, a couple of days, uh, more than one month old, uh, being held by my mother. Uh, this presumably is somewhere in London or Lambeth, Ontario. Here I am, a few months old. I have no idea what I've got on my head, whether it's uh, half a cantaloupe or some kind of space helmet. Here I am. I look about a year old. That's my older brother, Wayne, who's uh, virtually four years older than me. I look here to be a year and a half, two years old. I'm playing with one of those tops that you push down and it spins. I do remember those drapes. I appear to have a full-fledged uh, Western outfit here of uh, uh, a hat, a uh, vest, and a uh, revolver. This is a clipping from the Sarnia Free Press newspaper. I dated around 1952. Going uh, left to right, that's my cousin uh, Rosalie Higgins, my father, Robert, me, uh, my cousin Michael Higgins, and uh, my older brother Wayne. It's at some Kiwanis event. My father was a member of Kiwanis well into the 1960s. This is a staged photograph. I'm sure my parents paid someone to take it. It would have been uh, taken in uh, Montreal when we lived uh, on the island. This is my father and mother in August 1954 standing in front of my parents' uh, Buick. Coop. Here I am standing in front of that uh, same Buick. This uh, photograph would have been taken in the early 50s in the year or two that we lived in Sarnia. We lived in the upper half of a quadruplex on Prince Edward Drive on Montreal Island. Uh, from the time I was about three until I was six, more or less. Here's a photograph of my whole family, my uh, younger brother, John, who was four years younger than me, sitting to my left. And you can see my older brother and I both have on coonskin caps, which were all the rage in those days of uh, Davy Crockett on Di Walt Disney. So this Christmas photograph was taken at our... Uh, uh, apartment in the quadruplex on uh, Prince Edward Drive on Montreal Island. You can see my brother, uh, older brother Wayne in the uh, left-hand bottom corner looking a bit distracted. I'm looking straight at the camera with my bolo tie. There must be something going on to the left because my younger brother John's also looking in that direction. Uh, 
this is my grandfather, of course, uh, Stuart Donald, and my mother, mother and father. I can't say what uh, prompted the setup, but it's pretty clear somebody somebody was having fun. I'm wearing my father's overcoat. I've got a pad in my hand and a pen in my hand. I seem to be uh, delivering a, uh, a stern lecture. My brother there has on my father's uh, hat, uh, look, looking a little uh, lost. But he's got a briefcase in front of him. Here I am uh, at the age of 10, 1960, uh, playing with a badminton racket. As you can see, I was a little on the husky side back then. This is my mother and my two brothers and me standing in front of uh, what was then the family car. It was a later model Buick. I think it was a 1960. Uh, color was white. It was a convertible. It had a red leather interior, uh, power windows, the whole schmozzle. Another picture taken in October 1960, but at a different uh, location, and I expect. Every August, from the time I was oh, five or six, my um, Uncle Ted and Aunt Ivy would take... Uh, my older brother and me, and on a couple of the years, my older cousin, Ron Cool, to Hampton Beach, New Hampshire. Uh, they rent uh, a summer place for a couple of weeks. We'd go down from Montreal by bus, return by bus. And I think on the last occasion, uh, uh, my younger brother, John, uh, came along. Here we are in front of one rental. My uncle Ted and I are standing in front of a jockey that uh, was planted in front of what was the five-star hotel of uh, Hampton Beach, uh, New Hampshire. You can see a reflection in the window of uh, one of the other statues on the property with, of an Indian. Totally uh, politically incorrect these days. We had a lot of fun in the uh, Atlantic Ocean surf, but the water was always cold. Nonetheless, we went in and even snorkeled. Here my Aunt Ivy, me, and my older cousin Ron Cool are sitting on the beach at uh, Hampton Beach, New Hampshire. There's a gentle surf. He went on to become eventually the chief mechanic of uh, Air Canada. Being New Hampshire, most of the buildings in uh, Hampton Beach were constructed of wood, and clearly they have vulnerabilities. Standing on the porch of that uh, same rental, I see I'm wearing a t-shirt with flamingos on it. That would have uh, been a prize from a trip uh, my parents and my grandfather, Stuart, took to Florida in about 1953, 54. This is uh, my older brother Wayne, my cousin Ron, my youngest brother John, and me in front of that uh, same rental. We used it year after year. This, I guess, would be 1959. I can recall. At night, we were down uh, at the uh, Oceanside. There's a bandstand there, and there'd be a band playing. And one night, we were down there. The band stopped. The band leader pointed up in the sky and said, there's the Sputnik. And it was, uh, I think, Sputnik number three that the Russians uh, sent into space going by. You could just see this tiny spot of light moving across the sky. I'm goofing around here with my Uncle Ted. He loved his uh, beer. He was a true Englishman and also an inveterate pipe smoker. We moved from uh, Prince Edward Drive on Montreal Island to uh, this house on the south shore of the St. Lawrence River uh, in an area called Preville, which was part of St. Lambert, the town of St. Lambert back in that day. Uh, 
it, the address is 101 Languedoc Drive. You'll see in this picture a large tree uh, behind my mother and someone else. In the winter of 1958, that uh, tree that we'd uh, seen in the previous picture is gone, and there is a mountain of snow. The house was on a corner. Chapter 3. The Queen Elizabeth Hotel in Montreal had a high-end restaurant, and one of its uh, marketing uh, shticks was to invite prominent uh, personalities, political figures, celebrities, executives, and so forth to join its, quote, beaver club, unquote. It supposedly goes back to the days of the Courier de Bois and stuff like that. Here's my father signing the uh, members uh, register. There's my mother on the left and the restaurant staff waiting in anticipation behind him. At that time, he was uh, an executive, sales executive with the Canada Bread Company and had been for years. My older brother and I are here on a Canadian Forces Navy ship that uh, along with a couple of its sisters was uh, parked at uh, Montreal Harbor and my uncle Ted uh, took us down there and it's noted as September 1958. Nope, both me and my brother are wearing uh, jackets, sports jackets. This is my grade four uh, class photograph from 1960 at the time I was going to Westway Public School which was uh, east of Kipling Avenue, uh, south of Dixon, in Etobicoke. Here is my grade 5 class photograph from 1961. Again, this is from, uh, from when I was attending Westway Public School. The autograph page for the same grade 5 class photo shows... Uh, my signature in the uh, upper right corner. I can see some similarities to my signature today. For a period of time, my uh, father was the central Canadian uh, sales manager for uh, Seagram's Distilleries, uh, the Sam Bronfman Company. This is a photograph showing on the, showing on the left uh, Charles Bronfman, who was Samuel Bronfman's son and at the time the president of uh, Seagram's uh, Canada. And in the middle was um, is uh, Jack Baker. He's um, an ex-football uh, player, but at the time he was the vice president of sales for Seagram's Canada. And on the right is my father, who, as I say, was the central Canadian sales manager. Here are my parents at some event in Quebec City in January 1963. I don't know who the man on the left is, but he, his face rings a bell. I'm just wondering if he was a CBC personality at the time. This is the family dog, Taffy. Uh, she was a mutt, I'm sure, but uh, I think of the name given to her was that she was a toy terrier. This picture dates... Uh, from the late 60s, it shows Taffy lying on my bed. She'd been uh, hit by a car on the street, Grove Tree Road, outside our house. Uh, came home limping, uh, had some work done by a veterinarian, and thereafter she always walked with a limp and basically needed to be carried uh, up and down stairs. Here I have a jacket, vest, and tie for the grade 9 class photograph when I attended, as I did throughout high school, Thistletown Collegiate in uh, northern Etobicoke, the area called Rexdale. Uh, that's real Rob Ford country today. Uh, we lived in a sort of an enclave. It was uh, perched on a, uh, a hill uh, bounded by the Hubber River on one side, Islington Avenue on the other. It was called, we lived at 26 Grove Tree Road. This looks like my grade 10 uh, class photograph. I've uh, ditched the vest but I've and got a new uh, jacket, uh, still wearing a tie. 
the fellow uh, in front of me, more just to my left with the glasses on, is Garth Graham, who would eventually become one of my brothers in the high school fraternity. And we get together at a, for a reunion a few years ago. I did this uh, charcoal sketch in 1966 when I was 16. I've kept it all these years because I really think it's kind of cool. This is me uh, at Expo 67. Um, a friend of mine, Dave Bartlett, who was a fraternity brother of mine, and I went to uh, Expo 67. We went by train, came back by train. While we were there, we were there about three days, four days. We stayed at my aunt and uncle uh, Ted and Ivy's uh, apartment. They have a spare bedroom. It was a lot of fun. Very, very exciting uh, sort of uh, event. This is the sales receipt for the first car I ever owned. It was a 1961 Wolseley sedan. I paid a total of, including tax, $222 for it. This was in August 1968. This is a 1961 Wolseley. It's not the, the car I owned, but it's a duplicate, if you will, except mine was all black. It had a leather interior. And um, walnut trim everywhere. And if you went in the back seat, they had fold-down picnic tables that dropped down from the back of the front seat. Uh, it was a very plush car for its day, but it uh, it really needed the shock absorbers uh, replaced. I only owned it for about a month uh, and sold it for three hundred dollars. This is hard to read, but uh, this is a retail sales tax slip uh, and uh, a sales receipt, a bill of sale from the uh, seller of a, the next car I owned after the Wolseley and it was a 1961 Morris uh, Mini Miner. Uh, the bill of sale indicates I paid $50 for it. That's not true. I paid 110 but he put in a lower amount so I wouldn't have to pay as much retail sales tax. This is that 1961 Mini Morris. Uh, you can see it's got wood trim on the side. It uh, had a stick shift and uh, what I call barn doors at the back. They opened uh, outwards from the middle rather than being a single door or a hatchback kind of thing. Here it is uh, in profile taken on the driveway of our house at uh, 26 Road Tree Road. This is the certificate uh, mechanical fitness for the third car I owned, having sold the Mini Morris for a small profit. Uh, I bought a 1965 uh, MGB in 1968. It was in something like November or something. This is a mirror image of the uh, MGB I owned, including the wire wheel, wheels and the color but mine had a chrome uh, luggage rack on the trunk. Uh, it, you can't see it from here, but I don't imagine this MGB had fog lights on the front, which mine did. Uh, I had a tonneau cover as well as the uh, convertible uh, hand take up and take down uh, roof. It was a lot of fun. Stick shift, of course. This is uh, my 1952 Morgan plus four four seater. I purchased uh, purchased this car between first year and second year uh, university, so that would have been the uh, summer of 1970. I paid fifteen hundred dollars for it. Uh, it uh, was a stick shift, it, a Moss transmission, which made it very difficult uh, for the average person to work. Uh, it had no synchro mesh whatsoever. And the clutch pedal was a terror. You you literally literally had to spread out, push your back against the seat, push your leg down in order to get that clutch to work. But it was a lot of fun to drive because it was such an uh, eye catcher. This is my uh, friend and uh, fellow fraternity brother Harry Osmond and I sitting in the, uh, his driveway in the uh, Morgan. Notice the uh, leather belts holding the uh, hood down. Here's the Morgan in profile. I had to sell it uh, in the summer of 19, 
73 in order to raise money to pay law school tuition. Um, I sold it for 1250 bucks, which uh, broke my heart. I'd love to have it back for twice the price. Chapter 4. This is a uh, high school girlfriend, uh, Kathy Cook, uh, standing in the, on the front lawn of her family home. Uh, her father was uh, the, a water engineer for the uh, city of Toronto. He'd been a, uh, been a bomber pilot uh, in the uh, Canadian forces during World War II. That's his uh, Mercury Cougar there in the background. Here's my grade 12 class uh, photograph. Note the uh, homeroom teacher to my left uh, has his eyes closed. In high school, I was a member of a fraternity called uh, Gamma Delta Psi. We uh, were members of the Gamma Alpha chapter, which was located only at uh, Thistletown Collegiate. Here's uh, me with uh, six other brothers uh, of the fraternity. There was maybe at any point in time uh, 20 uh, member, active members. Um, you can see their, uh, the fraternity banner in the background. There were a couple other chapters in Toronto, uh, but uh, it was primarily a United States uh, organization. It was founded in Brookline, Massachusetts, out of Boston in the late 1800s. Uh, amongst its members were um, uh, uh, Douglas MacArthur, the uh, World War II Philippine American war hero, uh, and others like that. Uh, at the time, the chapters went all the way down to uh, Georgia. One of the fraternity rituals was uh, putting pledges through uh, hazing before they became uh, full members. Uh, these could uh, occur in various ways and various dis places, but here's one example of uh, what happens during the hazing. I'm here with my uh, other brothers in the Gamma Alpha chapter of Gamma Delta Psi. I, I don't know if we won something. Uh, the fellow to my left seems to be holding uh, something uh, with a degree of uh, pride. The man standing to my right is um, Garth Graham, who turned up uh, as the person standing in front of me in my great uh, 10 class photograph. The uh, fraternity held a annual convention of all the chapters at a hotel on the, um, on the strip outside uh, Pearson Airport. That would have been in, I think, 1969. Here's a photograph of some of the brothers that were in my chapter of the fraternity. Uh, the man standing in front is my brother, Wayne. Uh, starting from the left, the others are Dave Bartlett, Paul Milliken. I've forgotten his name, but next person over is Dean Miller. And lastly, Phil Wolfenden. I heard from Phil Wolfenden uh, in the late 80s, early 90s. He was working for a real estate development company. Doing uh, fundraisers for charities uh, was one of the things the fraternity uh, did, sometimes in conjunction with a sorority, uh, for example, uh, washing cars on the weekend. Um, this is a description of one of the events we had to raise money. We took over uh, YMCA, which was in an old uh, small church building in uh, Thistletown, and uh, sought to break the British Commonwealth uh, Marathon teeter-totter record which, as the article indicates, was accomplished. Uh, we did, uh, we did uh, uh, become uh, British Commonwealth record holders. Uh, it was well publicized on the radio and television, so it was a lot of good fun. Another photograph of uh, our chapter members. And again, the man standing behind me to my right is the man whose name I cannot remember, but he is so familiar. This documents a reunion that the Gamma Alpha chapter had. I think it was in around uh, 2015 or 16, some, somewhere in there. Uh, 
three or four of these people were of my vintage. The others came after me, and uh, I don't really know them. The man to my left is uh, Garth Graham, who was uh, in that uh, grade 10 uh, photograph. He's gained a lot of weight. This photograph is of the people uh, at that reunion who were in my chapter, Gamma Alpha, at the same time. We were all in high school together. Uh, Dave Bartlett, to my, my right, was uh, suffering from cancer. He was going through treatment, so he was not in the best of shape. Behind me is uh, Harry Oswin, and the man in the middle at the back is Phil Wolfenden, who actually, pardon me, was not in my chapter he was in a, another chapter of Gamma Delta Psi, and it was uh, based in um, Humberside Collegiate in uh, northern Etobicoke. This is the grade 12 class photo that's been printed in the Klansman yearbook, which was the high school yearbook. Uh, it lists all of the people, uh, all of the, uh, my fellow students in, uh, in grade 12, my particular homeroom. I was the classroom representative uh, to the Students' Administrative Council. I have no recollection of doing anything. This is my grade uh, 12 diploma. An entrepreneurial thing we did in high school was uh, uh, buy by a consignment a bunch of uh, chocolate bars. These are quarter pound uh, chocolate bars made by the world finest chocolate company uh, out of Campbellford, Ontario. We had them printed, the, me and a couple of buddies, uh, as uh, fundraisers for the Student Travel Association proceeds to assist our sum summer trip. Uh, we sold a few of them and uh, sent the rest back, so we made a little money. It was kind of fun. The uh, Thistletown Collegiate Yearbook was called The Klansman. This is the 1969 uh, edition, the front cover. Here is my entry in that uh, 1969, that would be grade 13 yearbook. It indicates my ambition is business administration at Western University. My destination is managing Max Milk. My act is waiting in line at the Motor Vehicle Bureau. Aversion, automobile graveyard, say, so meanwhile, I. So this excerpt from the uh, yearbook, uh, grade 12 yearbook, shows me in the, uh, as a Klansman representative, which meant I had something to do with putting together the yearbook. In the bottom half of the page, you see a photograph of uh, me and my three colleagues who were on a panel representing our school on the Reach for the Top quiz show. Uh, Reach for the Top was a quiz show put on by the Canadian Broadcasting uh, Corporation. It was uh, moderated by Alex Trebek, the, uh, who will be familiar with most people because of his association with Jeopardy and Double Jeopardy. Uh, he would ask a number of uh, general in knowledge questions and... Uh, the two panels, one from our school, one from a competing school, would uh, punch a button, a buzzer would ring, and if you were fast enough, you get to answer the question. Hopefully right. We won the first round, lost the second round uh, to a, a panel from Northern Secondary School. There, were Two of the four folks from Northern were twin brothers, uh, and they were really on top of things. It really piss me off. I can still remember this day punching my button and there's always a lag. So I think that yeah, I got to hit it first, but I didn't. The guys from Northern hit the button first. That was a contest where I did hit it, the button first before them, but I got the wrong answer. The question was, uh, uh, what's the source of the word barbarians? Uh, I punched the button uh, in a knee-jerk reaction, gave the answer, which was, well, back in the day, the Barbary pilots used to, pirates used to capture people and they would uh, tie them up uh, on a stake and uh, burn them to death. And that's how they got the word barbecue uh, from Barbary pir pirates. And uh, there we go. They became barbarians. So uh, I, that wasn't the correct answer. 
as you can see, the quality of uh, marketing around uh, Thistletown Collegiate was uh, not of top caliber. Here is my grade 13 graduating photograph. Grade 13 honor graduation diploma. The honor comes from the fact that I graduated from grade 13 and not just grade 12. I went to first year university at uh, Western Ontario. This is a photograph of the folks on my floor of a wing at uh, Saugeen Hall Residence, which was a, a brand new residence built for incoming uh, freshman students. The whole building was uh, full of freshmen. Uh, men on one side and on a wing on the other side on multiple floors uh, were the residences for the ladies. Uh, I'm showing here um, in the back row. It was a wild place, as you might imagine, with this uh, crew. Uh, a friend, Craig Archibald, and I uh, set up our own little painting business uh, one summer in, in order to raise money for tuition in the fall and uh, so forth. And this was the flyer that we uh, made up and uh, handed out uh, or delivered uh, throughout our neighborhoods. It, we, we did well. Uh, we, it was a kind of enjoyable work, but in well paid. Here is uh, Craig Archibald with... Uh, a boat we bought uh, together. It was a 16-foot uh, snipe, used uh, and uh, uh, heavily repaired. Uh, the insides were just coated with uh, fiberglass to keep the wood together, I guess. That's uh, one of the cars I owned, a 1968 or 69 Volkswagen Beetle. Uh, I used it to pull the boat around. It was uh, and it worked fine. Chapter 5. Here I am at a dinner table um, with my uh, future wife, Barbara, and to my right is one of my law school classmates, uh, Renee Sorrell. He went on to be a securities lawyer, as I recall. This would be taken at the um, student residence, the graduate residence is, uh, is where the law students uh, lived. This is a photograph of me and uh, my wife, future wife Barbara on the Bruce Trail in uh, Caledon one winter. Law school graduation photograph. The ceremony at which I was formally received my Bachelor of Laws degree and scroll was uh, June 9th, 1975. I have uh, zero recollection of the convocation ceremony itself, but here's the order of convocation. I redlined uh, my name on this uh, list of candidates for degrees, uh, unlike a couple of handfuls of uh, other uh, students graduating, uh, I didn't receive a degree with honors. Here is uh, myself and two of my law school colleagues. On the left uh, is Nils Jensen. In the middle is uh, Mike Eisen. Um, Mike eventually went on to become uh, general counsel for Microsoft Canada. Osgoode Hall Law School, York University, graduating class photograph, 1975. I'm third from the left in the top left corner. The interviews uh, I went to at uh, downtown law firms to uh, gain a articling uh, student position with them all resulted in uh, dead ends, uh, including uh, Aird and Burles, a firm that I would uh, later become a partner in. Uh, they didn't uh, even have... Uh, the grace to offer <laughs> to to interview me, but here I am uh, with uh, three um, lawyers, actually four, uh, from the firm I started articling with, and that was a fr the firm of Luck and Harris. They were located in an office building 
on the east side of uh, Kipling Avenue, where it um, is bisected by the 401. I, at the time, it was called the Mantella Building, and it may still be the Mantella Building. Uh, that's the name of a famed real estate developer. To my right is Edward Edluck, who was a name partner, and uh, to, the, to the left of him are two of my colleagues. I can't recall their name, but they were lawyers. They weren't articling students. This is taken at uh, Ed Luck's uh, cottage on Six Mile Bay in uh, off Georgian Bay. Correction, it was uh, Twelve Mile Bay, and here we list the or listed the people in the photograph. So there was uh, Brennan, I've forgotten his first name, on the uh, far left. The man uh, beside uh, Ed Luck is just described as. Luck's man, so I guess he was just a general assistant, Ed Luck and me, and it says there's a bill, can't read it, in the background. He was um, an articling student, Bill. I assisted um, Bruce Haynes, uh, counsel to Luck and Harris, uh, at a trial that was uh, carried on in early June of 1975, briefly put a uh, fellow by Igor, by the name of Igor Guzenko, was suing, amongst other people, uh, the Harris in Luck and Harris for uh, solicitor's negligence, which uh, he claimed uh, suffered, caused him to suffer some hundreds of thousands of uh, dollars of damages. So Bruce Haynes was representing. Uh, Harris, and uh, this is a sketch I made while I was sitting there in the courtroom being bored out of my mind, and it shows Judge Goodman uh, in the center, below him a couple of uh, court officials, clerks, and to the right, uh, court reporter, and in the box is uh, Mr. Handing, QC, testifying. Uh, apparently he's a lawyer from Borden and Elliott. Just by way of background, Igor Guzenko was a Soviet defector. He worked in the uh, Russian embassy in Ottawa in the late 40s. And uh, he defected and carried with him a lot of information about uh, Canadians who were uh, consorting with the Russians, including one person who's, I think his name was Max Rose, uh, was a member of uh, Parliament, federal Parliament. Uh, needless to say, he was uh, tossed out of Parliament, and I think he went to prison as well. Guzenko went into sort of a witness protection program. Uh, it never had to work a day in his life, and so uh, his hobby was su suing lawyers. Somewhere along the way, I lost a scroll, the diploma, uh, evidencing uh, that I am uh, received a Bachelor of Laws from uh, Osgood. Uh, fortunately for me, at some point in time, Osgood decided they weren't going to give out Bachelor of Law degrees anymore. Uh, instead, graduates would get a Juris Doctor. And they went to all the alumni and, and offered to supply them uh, with a new diploma showing that they were a Juris Doctor. And I think it was free or it was very minimal cost. So needless to say, I applied and uh, this is what I received and this is now uh, evidence of who I am, amongst other things, a Juris Doctor. At some point in June or earlier or later, I uh, decided I was not happy at Luck and Harris. I didn't find it challenging enough and it wasn't giving me enough uh, uh, experience. So I s started circulating the um, curriculum bite eye that I'd used in uh, earlier applications, and this is the cover page. So this is uh, the general information that I was providing folks, all, all quite correct. Allowing that this uh, CV uh, was prepared much earlier than uh, June, it was probably prepared maybe even in December of 1974. Uh, this is all correct, although I do identify this reference under employment, Banff Bam Springs Hotel, summer 1970. That, I think, w is fanciful. I don't recall that. 
Yeah, these are all correct, I think, uh, although I should say that the uh, second semester were all Bs, so they'd make up everything down to taxation and further. My hunt for a replacement articling position led to a job, job offer from Macaulay Perry. Uh, Peter Harris was their tax lawyer. Just to explain, all of these people had uh, previously been partners or associates at uh, Thompson Rogers, which is a uh, law firm that's still around today, at least in name. Uh, they broke away from uh, Thompson Rogers to uh, form their own firm. And I think uh, at this point, they were only in about their first or second year of operation. Uh, Robert McCauley, who's listed here as, uh, amongst others, uh, counsel, uh, was previously a minister of various uh, air, uh, departments uh, in the Leslie Frost uh, government. And he was called the minister of uh, everything. His father had been the leader of the Conservative Party in the early 1900s. Uh, uh, he, he wanted to replace Leslie Frost as a Conservative leader, which would have made him Premier of the province of Ontario. There was sort of a runoff leadership contest. He didn't win. He went off into uh, private law practice, made himself uh, a fortune. Uh, he was a very prominent lawyer. Amongst other things, he was the lead lawyer on the incorporation of uh, the Toyota Motor Company of Canada, or whatever it's called. Uh, anyway, he was very politically connected. This firm was very politically connected. While I was articling at uh, Macaulay Perry, uh, I was a passenger in a, in a car that T-boned another car at the intersection of Young Street and uh, York Mills Road. Uh, the other driver made an unsafe safe turn and my guy couldn't stop, but it turned out to be a, quite a con conflagration. Some uh, passerby had stopped and pulled me out of the car before it uh, blew up in flames. But there was a silver lining to the whole thing because uh, um, me and two other passengers in the car ended up uh, suing the other driver and there was we had a lawyer and there was a settlement from the insurance company. I got uh, $4,500 which I'd uh, later use as a down payment on a sailboat. I was uh, called to the uh, bar of uh, Ontario on March 29, 1977. Uh, this is uh, a scan of the uh, program, uh, including all the folks who were not only being admitted to the bar, but were receiving various prizes. Uh, I'm not in the list. I'm on the eighth line from the top of the list of people being called to the bar. The $4,500 I got in the uh, car crash insurance settlement I used for a down payment on a sailboat, uh, I financed the rest. This is the sailboat. It's a 24-foot CNC uh, sloop. We sailed it out of uh, Port Credit Harbor. They had they have a private marina down there, and we had a dock right on the uh, south end. My wife Barbara and I are shown sitting in the cockpit of the uh, sailboat, the grass fire. I'm showing here at the helm of the gra grass fire. These are all the photographs I have of that boat and my use of it. We owned it for uh, just a couple of years. We bought a house in 1979 and uh, uh, I, I wanted to sell the boat to use uh, the funds to help finance the house purchase. So all in all, it was fine. It was a lot of fun. Barbara and I are shown here at uh, St. Andrews by the Sea in New Brunswick. This was sort of the uh, easterly most uh, destination in a road trip we, we took uh, one summer. We met up with my friend Craig Archibald there and we had a lot of fun with the friends he'd met. His mother is, was a permanent resident of uh, 
St. Andrews by the Sea at that uh, by that time. This is my wife Barbara's uh, grandfather, Charles Hilmer. I believe he was mayor of uh, the town of Oakville at one point in time. Barbara's father, Donald Hilmer. This is a family dinner in Oakville. Barbara is showing, she's a child at the time, in the bottom right-hand corner next to her is uh, her her mother, Margaret, uh, and then um, uh, uh, an aunt, I think, an Ida, and, and then uh, her grandmother and uh, Charles Hilmer, her grandfather. A wedding photograph of Barbara's father and mother, Donald Hilmer and Margaret Hilmer. Barbara and I were married on August 6, uh, 1977. This is a, a photograph of us with uh, each of our surviving parents. We had a small wedding by most standards. Uh, what we did was uh, we um, uh, rented or reserved uh, a suite at the Royal York Hotel. It had a bedroom, and off the bedroom was a large uh, uh, living room in which there was a large dining room table. And we invited about, I don't know, eight or ten friends plus uh, our parents, and uh, the hotel served dinner. Uh, we were allowed to bring in our own alcohol, and uh, all in all, we were, I think, within three figures in terms of the cost when it was all over, and we had a, a fine time. Barbara and I are here sh showing sitting uh, on two of the dining room tables with our parents in behind. Chapter 6. This is the cover of a sort of business community or oriented magazine that was published in 1977 and maybe later I don't know who published it or how successful it was but it was brought to our attention not because of the cover it relates to fall 1977 the back cover shows me and uh, one of the other young lawyers at uh, what was Macaulay Perry but at that point I think had become uh, Perry Farley and Honest Chuck walking uh, south on Bay Street mm, I think immediately north of uh, King Street Barbara and I are shown here celebrating something we are holding a or I'm holding a bottle of champagne in my hand and she's holding a glass of champagne uh, we're in our house the first house we owned at uh, 39 Thome Crescent in uh, Midtown Toronto. Barbara and I are showing with a group of friends that I've known since uh, high school um, and their wives. Wife. We're here in uh, a small lake in uh, Halliburton. Uh, Ernie Hahn, who's the fellow in the uh, greenish coat with the uh, mustache and glasses, father owned a cottage on this property had been in the family for uh, decades and uh, we were up there in the winter time it was a real hard slog getting in the snow was deep and so forth but we uh, cross-country skied around the lake this was sort of a weekend uh, fun getaway Barbara and I are here in uh, Jamaica in I think it was around 1983 we've obviously conned somebody into taking our photograph I'm shown here on the balcony of our hotel room in Jamaica the hotel at the time was called the Trelawney Beach Hotel I'm here with all the other council on uh, 
an Ontario Municipal Board hearing that went uh, on in London in, I think it was 1982. Uh, I can confirm that in the next uh, slide. But uh, to my left is Alan Rock. Uh, he went on to be treasurer of the Law Society and uh, chancellor of the uh, Carleton University. Uh, to my right is uh, Carthy uh, QC. Uh, he was uh, with Weir and Folds. He was representing uh, the owner, the owners. I think they're called the Jeffreys uh, of a very, at that time, very large. Uh, shopping mall in London. Um, the person sitting in front of me is also from Perry Farley on a check. He was there representing um, Oshawa Group Limited, I think. I was representing Loblaws. Um, and there's other counsel. The, the man to the far right was uh, Al Schwartz, Schwartz, Alan Schwartz. Uh, he eventually left law and be uh, became an investment advisor with uh, the Shifkin, uh, forgotten the name of the firm. Anyway, uh, the fellow with the beard uh, was uh, City of London's lawyer. This uh, was a, a long hearing. So this is a full list of the counsel shown in the photograph. And sorry, Carthy QC, who was to my right in the picture, is uh, Jim Carthy, Carthy, James Carthy. He went on to... Uh, sit on the uh, Court of Appeal, I think, or the, yeah, Court of Appeal. This is a book plate that was on the inside cover of a coffee table type book that was given to me by the uh, Canadian Bar Association for doing a presentation at one of their uh, seminars. On one or more summer occasions, we uh, rented a cottage uh, different cottages from time to time. This is up uh, in uh, the Perry Sound area. Uh, and I'm showing here with Peter on a windsurf type board uh, in the lake. It wasn't a great lake. The cottage we purchased on Star Lake in or about 1987 came with a, a wooden sailboat. Uh, that needed some refreshing. So I, I spent quite a bit of time uh, sanding down the uh, rough paint, cleaning it up, replacing hardware or filling in missing hardware and so forth, doing some paint work and, and all the like, getting it uh, presentable to actually sail. This shows me on the uh, maiden voyage uh, of the Titanic uh, as soon as the thing got into any kind of water, I put my foot down and went right through the floor of this old, as I, as I then knew, decrepit wooden boat. Uh, it was eventually replaced with a, a, a plastic uh, sailboat uh, or fiberglass. It, it was great. You, it really zipped along. I was a founding men member, first director, first secretary, uh, of a social club uh, called the Mandarin Club of Toronto. Uh, this is a photograph of 18 of the 21 founding members on, I think, the first uh, official occasion uh, inaugurating the, uh, the club itself. This was a very powerful group uh, in the Asian community. After three runs at the exams, uh, specifically the uh, exams for law office accounting, uh, I managed to get into the uh, uh, bar of the uh, Law Society of England and Wales in 1996, expecting that that would be a ticket to become a, a solicitor of the bar of Hong Kong. Unfortunately, they changed the rules midstream uh, in my uh, efforts to get admitted as, as a solicitor of the Supreme Court of England and Wales, and uh, it was all for nothing. But it's kind of fun having the uh, credentials. Needless to say, I've always been a solicitor who does not practice and advertises as such. Martindale Hubble is sort of a relic of uh, 
directories that listed everybody and sundry in specific dis disciplines. You could find a lawyer anywhere in North America with Martindale Hubble's directories. They were about five inches thick, and I think there were more than one of them uh, to cover North America. But amongst other things, in the um, Internet age or the more modern age, they got into uh, rating lawyers. Uh, they do a survey in uh, you know the area of lawyer practices, such generally speaking. So, for example, it might be land development or municipal law at the time and get a, uh, a rating from them as uh, to your skills and your uh, professionalism and so forth. So this was uh, this rating comes from Martindale Hubble indicating I get a peer rating of 4.4 out of 5.0, uh, which is, I think, pretty good. I purchased a new Corolla uh, hatchback in uh, the spring of 2019, and uh, they gave me uh, a hat as uh, you know a gesture of how great a customer I was. So I stripped off all, all of the Toyota co corporate uh, logo ship on on the hat, and I used it to. Uh, uh, find a permanent home from some badges uh, from my past. So, of course, you see right square on this uh, left side of the hat, uh, my Boy Scouts of Canada badge. I was briefly a Boy Scout. From the back right, uh, starting at the top, you'll see a, a small round badge that uh, em is emblematic of the uh, Mandarin Club of Toronto. We had 21 members and this plum flower has 20, whatever they call those things that flowers have, plus the center black portion, which is the chairman of the club. And uh, that was that badge. Uh, beneath it is Rawlinson moving in storage. That was on my shirt uh, for a period of time. I worked uh, for Rawlinson moving in storage. They were up in North York, not far from the York University campus. Uh, one full summer, and I think the following summer, but certainly uh, on occasion during the year when they needed a big crew for an office move or something like that. Uh, when I left, I was a regular uh, truck driver. I had a five tons truck and uh, a, a crew of one or two people, depending on the job. To the right of that is uh, my Rotary International badge. I joined the Rotary Club of North York chapter in 1996. I was secretary, I think, in 1997, and then vice president in 1998, and then president in 1999. Uh, as I recall, maybe it's all off by uh, one year too too far in the in the past. But anyway. This last badge is uh, the badge of the uh, Gamma Delta Psi fraternity, of which we were Gamma. I was a member of Gamma Alpha chapter, and the motto of the uh, of the fraternity was "Consequence Umquan Descends Numquan." Now, some people might look at this badge and think the motto was "Consequence Numquan Umquan Descends," but no, it's not. If you actually follow the flow of the badge uh, as if it was uh, um, a Mobius strip, you'll see it's consequence umquan numquan descends. Or, sorry, consequence umquan descends numquan. I've tried to find out what that means in uh, English uh, and have completely struck out. I. I, I I've got a definition for consequence, and I think maybe for umquan and numquan, but descends is a mystery. Chapter 7. In the summer of uh, 1996, I gave a, 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 I delivered a paper at uh, a convention of, of the Association of Municipal Clerks and Treasurers Apparently, uh, my workshop was New Techniques in Bylaw Enforcement. So this uh, are, is a summary of two 
responses to the uh, people who put the presentation on, uh, summarizing um, people in the audience's assessment of uh, my the delivery of my paper. Uh, on one, I sort of struck out. Uh, on number two, it looks uh, pretty positive. One respondent identified me as very confident, forward slash informative, on provisions of the law. Very informative session, he wrote or she wrote. I had a client that was working with Four Seasons as a, kind of a joint venture partner on a particular project and uh, there was uh, Four Seasons Architect was a, a bit of a snooty um, a-hole and at one point in time he uh, take a, let me take a step back uh, my one of my clients uh, senior officer's wife was an architect and she was working on the project for the client in any event, Four Seasons Architect uh, kind of got in her face and at one point in time basically accused her on paper of being incompetent. And so it was generally felt that uh, was deserving, uh, on my side of the fence, it was felt it was deserving of uh, some kind of recompense uh, or reckoning. Uh, so when we met, uh, eventually, senior Four Seasons guy, uh, Roger Garland, the vice chairman, was confirming that five weeks uh, of usage would be uh, uh, provided free of charge at uh, the Chiang Mai Resort, that's in Thailand, or the Nevis Resort. I delivered a paper at uh, this particular seminar. It doesn't say on this page what it was about, but as I recall, it had something to do with um, Site, site plan control, the application of uh, site plan control to new development through the Planning Act. This is a thank you letter from uh, Stephen LeDrew, uh, a lawyer in, in uh, Toronto at the same time <coughs> I was practicing. His son and my son, Peter, are very, very good friends and have been for quite some time. I worked uh, with the Royal Bank of Canada on a project that their real estate arm was uh, pursuing uh, at the corner of uh, King Street and Spadina. It all worked out uh, very well. They got the uh, approvals that they needed to build the building they needed, and uh, we got along uh, very well. Ultimately, the uh, project didn't proceed. Uh, the uh, recession that uh, the, pretty much the world was experiencing about that time uh, drove uh, its implementation into the uh, realm of impossible. I acted on a case uh, Loblaws against the chief building official of the town of Ancaster, Mr. Oliver. Uh, I was acting for Loblaws, and it uh, the tussle had to do with the chief building official issuing a building permit for the construction of a Price Club uh, super box store. Now, Price Club isn't around anymore. It was uh, acquired by uh, uh, Costco. Uh, but it was the same kind of concept, a huge uh, hangar size uh, building uh, full of stuff in large sizes and so forth. It became a significant case uh, for some legal principles that it established. Canada Law Book wrote me a letter asking me for some uh, information because they were going to, and did, uh, report the case in the Dominion Law Reports. That's kind of a big deal. The decision was eventually uh, reported in the Dominion Law Reports. There were appeals. Uh, Price Club lost the case, Loblaws won. Uh, Price Club appealed the decision to the uh, Court of Appeal, or yeah, the Court of Appeal. Uh, 
and uh, we cross appeal with respect to the cost order because uh, the lower court uh, had uh, decided not to award costs to either party for reasons that may or may not be set out in the decision. <clears throat> As it happens, both the appeal and the cross appeal were dismissed. This summarizes my response to the law book company's inquiry. Assisting me at the trial was a lawyer a little bit younger than me by the name of David Miller. He went on to be uh, mayor of the city of Toronto. This you could call a fragment of the uh, documentary record of a committee of adjustment uh, uh, matter that a client had engaged me to pursue at, in the city of Toronto. And the ward councillor's uh, general letter sent out to all and sundry uh, kind of indicates how fires can get stoked and things can get complicated. This ultimately went on to the OMB and uh, as I, we had, this was a period of the, the uh, uh, Ray government, uh, the NDP, uh, they appointed Looney Tunes to the OMB and uh, we lost uh, at the OMB. Thirty years ago, developers traded uh, objections to uh, their respect, respective uh, enemies' projects in order to lever something else or this, that, and the other thing. Uh, this uh, is a letter from Lloyd Alter, who was the architect on a project uh, on uh, Wellington Street that I had lodged an uh, objection to on behalf of a client. It all got it sorted out between the clients themselves, and it was withdrawn. And he was just sort of thanking me to get together. He lived across the street from um, me and my family on at 39th Own Crescent. And uh, the Bruce McCormick uh, he speaks of uh, owned the house two doors down from 39th Own Crescent. So I guess that would make it 35th Own Crescent. Yeah. I can't recall what I, I did to uh, deserve this thank you, but it's positive, so I include it. From some point in 1989 until 1992, I acted uh, as counsel to a real estate developer trying to get approval for a regional shopping center in the city of Woodstock. This was a note from one of the city councillors, uh, Sandy Talbot, uh, which uh, reported on uh, some attitudes towards uh, me and my client uh, dur during the era, early days of the uh, adventure. So the ed editors of the uh, newspaper gave me a boo uh, for my views on how to take uh, the attitudes of certain objectors to the uh, shopping center. And uh, the editors told me to uh, get back to the salt mines. I acted for some heavyweights uh, in uh, their efforts to uh, enlarge the Hudson's Bay Center, which is located at the uh, northeast corner of Young Street and Bloor in the city of Toronto. Uh, they wanted to uh, uh, construct uh, a high rise addition uh, for residential condominiums at the uh, West End. And there were legal issues, and I got involved with respect to one aspect, and uh, apparently I uh, uh, clinched the deal. A municipal election in uh, Scarborough one year was so close that uh, there was a judicial recount of the votes in, in front of a judge of the Superior Court of Justice. Uh, I acted for uh, the, the counselor, the incumbent counselor, and he'd been a counselor for years and years and years to represent him on, uh, on the recount. Uh, it resulted in uh, his election, re-election being confirmed, and here he uh, thanks me. 
a partner of mine, uh, Jane Papino, had a client that was a group of ratepayers opposing a proposal by a church to build a senior citizen's home in its uh, church's backyard, so to speak. Uh, I handled the hearing, and uh, the outcome was uh, positive, uh, probably not surprisingly, although the uh, city staff, at that time it was the city of York staff, uh, were in favor of it. The council was not, the ratepayers were not, and the Ontario Municipal Board was not. This is a copy of my letter to Nick Kingersty, who was the uh, clerk administrator of the town of Fort Francis for many, many years. Uh, I, I came to know him when I was, uh, I think I was even an articling student, but certainly a jun junior lawyer at uh, Macaulay Perry, Perry Farley, Honest Chuck. Uh, they had a big, big case in which uh, one of the two counsel of Macaulay Perry, Perry Farley, Honest Chuck, handled. His name was Royce uh, Frith. He was a senator, a Canadian senator, uh, but a practicing lawyer. And the case involved uh, um, a, a dam uh, that was owned by Boise Cascade, the lumber paper company, uh, which had been built on the strength of a contract signed like uh, 80 years earlier or something that gave a royalty to the town of Fort Francis uh, for the privilege of building the dam and being able to use it. Uh, and as well, it provided for the delivery of power to the town of Fort Francis up to certain limits. The uh, royalty payments uh, became, became ridiculous over the years relative to the price of electricity. And the town was uh, suing to get a declaration that uh, the, uh, in effect, the contract terms uh, should be viewed as malleable and uh, the royalty should be uh, adjusted for inflation, in effect. Anyway, uh, the Supreme Court of, Court of Canada did not agree. A thank you note uh, for a client dealing with a uh, project in the uh, mid 80s when uh, the market was very, very hot. This, uh, this was a very large project in the uh, area of Lawrence and Don Mills Road in Toronto. A partner at uh, Aird and Burles had uh, referred uh, a relative of his, I, I think he was his uncle, uh, uh, for me to handle a case that, uh, regarding the severance of his uncle's or relative's uh, property in King City. And it all worked out uh, very well. It turned out he was a, quite a very powerful uh, executive. Uh, he was involved as uh, you know the head honcho in uh, a very major project in the uh, downtown of Toronto. That said, uh, this was his personal uh, endeavor. That project was the uh, new CBC building on Front Street uh, in Toronto, opposite the uh, convention center. John Aird, as well as being a name partner in the uh, Air Burles uh, law firm, had been Lieutenant Governor of Ontario for a term or two. Uh, his uh, license plate uh, was a vanity plate that said LG25. He was the 25th Lieutenant Governor of the uh, province of Ontario. Here he is thanking me for something. He was a great guy, just a delightful, nice person. Martindale Hubble is a publisher uh, of uh, directories of various professions, including the legal profession. Uh, it, it, their directories go back uh, decades, and if you were to buy one, I'll say 10 years ago, I'm not even sure they publish them in print anymore as opposed to online, uh, it would be uh, three volumes, each about five inches thick. They uh, used to conduct surveys of lawyers, I think only when they're in large law firms, as I was uh, at, uh, for a period of time, uh, to uh, 
survey other professionals as to what they may think about uh, uh, you uh, from various aspects, professionalism, ethics, so forth, so forth. Anyway, uh, Martindale and Hubble rates me 4.4 of 5.0, which is uh, pretty good. They uh, trade off their surveys by offering plaques to lawyers who get uh, high ratings. Uh, they do that by uh, soliciting through email. I'm not going to pay what they want for these things. I don't think I've ever checked the price, but it was more than a dollar. I wouldn't buy it. Uh, but I copied their uh, the uh, photo in their sales pitch, and this is it. If I wanted to, I, I could have one of these hanging in my office, but uh, uh, that's not me. I've thrown out more plaques than, in fact, I've thrown out every plaque I've ever received. Chapter 8. When I retired in August of 2017 and unretired in uh, September of 2017, uh, I wanted to polish my skills in wills and estates because I considered that if I'm going to be marketing myself to a local uh, clientele, probably private, not corporate clientele, uh, this is a skill I needed to be totally 100% on. So I signed up for this uh, Osgood Hall intensive program in Wills and Estates. The, um, the tuition was like $3,000, which is not small change. And it was totally uh, on online, uh, except for one day when all the students turned up for uh, uh, a complete uh, seminar and testing session. It was really cool. It was a good, good thing. And it was worth the $3,000, no question. This is a photograph of me in the library of uh, the condominium on Concord Place where Barbara and I lived for about five years. Uh, these are the robes I wore when I was called to the bar. And I wanted to get a picture of them because I had uh, no other pictures of me in court robes. Uh, as I was donating them to uh, uh, the Law Society of Upper Canada, now called the Law Society of Ontario, uh, I uh, contacted them and asked, uh, you know, how could I find a newly graduating student uh, being called to the bar who needed a set of robes because I'd be happy to give them away. And they said, no, nah, they didn't have that kind of facility, but they were developing a store uh, of uh, robes and, and so forth for the call to the bar ceremony that they were going to be eventually offering to students. So I hopped in and uh, I donated my robes, I think, in April of 2017. I had to repurchase the whole set. I have yet to... Uh, wear the uh, new set in court, but I do have them. 1975 and uh, 2017. This would have been the uh, second passport uh, I ever had. I don't know where the first one went. It's unfortunate it uh, is lost. But maybe at that uh, time you had to turn in your previous passport before they issue you a new one and they didn't return the old one? I'm not sure. Anyway, I don't have one. But this is the first one that I have had that I have uh, copies of, and it was issued in 1993. I would have been 43 years old. Page uh, 7 is a stamp from the island of St. Martin. I went there after a, uh, a long OMB hearing, um, in February of 1998, uh, a week by myself, I just stayed in a hotel, small hotel on the French side of, uh, of the island. Um, I was just trying to wind down. I had a good week. It was all fine. So on page nine, we have some stamps, uh, Hong Kong and uh, Bangkok. I went to Thailand in 95 by myself for about, I don't know, I think uh, eight days, something in that order. Uh, again, just to wind down, I, 
amongst other things, I went to uh, Chiang Mai, uh, stayed at uh, a country club there that was associated with the Mandarin Club of Toronto. It was an interesting tourist trip. Uh, I see at the bottom of page nine a stamp from St. Chris- St. Kitts and Nevis uh, in 1995. I went there a few times uh, uh, with a partner, also with uh, Barbara. And on the uh, left, a uh, couple of stamps from the Dominican Republic. That would have been with the family, I expect. We went to Jack Tar Village there on um, one year. This uh, stamp marks my uh, travel to uh, London, England, to write the uh, uh, bar examinations for the Law Society of England and Wales. That was a whirlwind uh, uh, trip. I I don't know what day of the week it was, but let's say I, I left on a Tuesday, arrived uh, at, in the very early morning uh, London time, <clears throat> couldn't uh, occupy my room because it was before that time when the hotel lets you do it, and I slept on a couch for uh, a number of hours. The following day, well, and then I scouted out the area, did some more study. The following day, I wrote the exam, uh, and then I did some other stuff. I went down to um, Trafalgar Square and poked around, and then the following uh, morning, I took a, in London time, I took a bus to um, Heathrow, uh, back to Canada. I'm not sure what this is for but I my guess is that I was traveling through New York City on to somewhere so this was the national branding for passports back in that day this passport was uh, issued in 1999 I would have been 49 at this point in time and getting a little chubby. These stamps uh, mark uh, two occasions for me. One was a trip to Singapore, uh, arrived uh, March 14th and left on uh, March 17th. Uh, I was engaged by a Toronto developer to be part of a marketing team that flew over to Singapore, uh, made presentations to uh, uh, Singapore uh, residents uh, uh, inviting a purchase of condominium units in a new development they were doing at the corner of uh, Bay Street and Cumberland. Uh, I was to be the independent solicitor that these to ease these people into the uh, uh, realm of purchasing foreign property uh, to put their minds at ease and so forth. It was a really good gig. Uh, I was not paid to travel there, uh, but all my expenses were covered. So I flew over, uh, flew back, uh, stayed in a very nice hotel where in, in which the presentations were being made and uh, garnered, I think it was half a dozen people that purchased units and engaged me to do the closings. So it was fun. Uh, the other... Um, uh, memory this brings back is a trip to uh, St. Martin, apparently, uh, according to the uh, date stamp, uh, July 25, 2000. I went with uh, Barbara. We rented a villa on the French side of the island, uh, uh, just above what I believe is called uh, Oyster Bay. It was a gorgeous uh, unit that we'd rent uh, rented. Uh, the villa consists of a main villa, which is used only by the owner's family, and a guest uh, wing, which is connected to the uh, main unit by a covered walkway, open-air walkway, uh, which was two stories. The bedroom was in the top story, and uh, an uh, open kitchen on the ground floor with a living room and so forth, and w- wraparound windows uh, overlooking uh, Oyster Bay and the Caribbean. Lovely place. We were burgled twice. Uh, On one occasion, money uh, was stolen. On the other occasion, my laptop was stolen. And uh, 
the uh, other interesting incident was I was uh, in my rental car rear-ended by a school bus while stopped in a queue waiting for a light to change. Suffice to say, we got to know the local constabulary uh, pretty well, and uh, we were just treated uh, beautifully, so I have no complaints. In 2001, uh, David, my son, and I uh, took a trip to uh, Southeast Asia. We uh, flew to initially to uh, Bangkok, stayed there for six days, just uh, sightseeing, usual tourist stuff in Bangkok. Uh, then we flew to Singapore. I met up with the clients uh, that had engaged me the previous year to act on their purchase transactions. Uh, and then we flew to Hong Kong uh, and uh, met up with an um, old uh, friend, uh, client of mine who uh, run, owns a pharmaceutical company in Hong Kong. And he took us to the uh, restaurant on Victoria Island or on, on Hong Kong Island called, Victor called Victoria's Peak for a really nice dinner. It was uh, quite interesting. This is the last passport issued to me, which has expired. I have another, which I haven't used, and it's good for until 2029, I think. All of these stamps uh, relate to a trip Barbara and I took to uh, Thailand and thence on to Kuala Lumpur in Malaysia to attend a wedding reception for uh, the daughter uh, of a friend of ours in the Asian community in Toronto. We stayed, uh, the whole trip took about 10 days. We stayed, uh, or, or perhaps longer, we stayed a number of days in Phuket on, I think, Caron Beach. Uh, we were away from the water in a gorgeous uh uh, low-rise hotel room, uh, single story, but we had uh, our own lap pool with a waterfall uh, you could turn on and off with a switch. There was an open-air kitchen. You could have people come in to cook your food, or you could go to the, uh, to the uh, hotel restaurant and eat there. Uh, it had an outdoor uh, hot tub, wooden tub that you could... Uh, have a bath in uh, and an outdoor shower as well as a regular indoor shower. Uh, they kept a mini bar stock with beer and uh, so forth. It was a great time. Um, anyway, we flew to, at the time there was some uh, civil unrest in uh, Thailand and it looked worrisome as if we could uh, make our connecting flight from Phuket to um, uh, Kuala Lumpur. But fortunately, it cleared up on the day of our flight, and we did uh, fly to Kuala Lumpur, stayed at the Shangri-La Hotel, flew back to Phuket, stayed two nights at uh, a Marriott Hotel in the north end of the island, uh, and also visited a, visited a JW Marriott uh, Hotel, newly constructed, and they were selling timeshares, so fortunately, we got a ride to and from the airport for free just uh, by virtue of attending a timeshare sales pitch. We also got a lot of uh, swag out of it. Uh, I think we had a bathrobe, a uh, couple of t-shirts, a hat, I don't know. <laughs> anyway, coming back from that uh, trip after stay having stayed at the uh, Marriott, uh, we flew to Los Angeles, and then there was a long, long layover, like about 10 hours. We arrived on August 22nd, 2008. Barbara and I ended up uh, basically hanging around, sleeping around in the terminal all night long. I think it was like from 10 at night or 11 at night until 7 in the morning. Nothing was open. I think there was one shop or uh, lunch counter or snack bar that was open, and that was it. Chapter 9. This is my kindergarten uh, report card. I went to Sir Arthur Curry School. He's a, 
a, a hero of World War One, although there's a currently a debate about whether he was a hero or a thug. Anyhow, uh, this was when we were living on uh, Prince Edward Drive on uh, Montreal Island. Ratings uh, generally seems to be okay, but apparently I lack uh, originality in uh, art and handwork. By 1957, we'd moved from uh, Mont Montreal Island to the uh, south shore of the uh, St. Lawrence, Prairieville, St. Lambert. Apparently, I was assigned in a, to a vacation school and uh, successfully got the certificate. Grade 1 report card. All in all, my grades were pretty ho-hum. Grade 2 report card. Another grade 2 report card. This one from Victoria Park School. That would be in St. Lambert. Clearly, I got a pass. I'm working hard, but need to work a little harder on my arithmetic combinations. Grade 3 report card. The left-hand page right column shows uh, stunning numbers. If I'm to take them to be uh, percentage grades, I was doing a stellar job. I got promoted. Grade 4 report card. This grade 4 report card uh, starts in uh, 1959. We've moved to Toronto. We were living in a rental house on Kipling Avenue, and I was uh, going to Westway Public School, which is located uh, south of Dixon Road, east of uh, Kipling in uh, Etobicoke, or what was then Etobicoke. Looks like I was, uh, again, doing stellar work. Grade 5 report card, again at Westway Public School. My good grades were well-earned, but apparently I was slipping in some subjects. So in this grade five spring report card, uh, my final uh, spring marks were all A's, B's, and one C's in art. Apparently I'm a poor artist. Uh, she does mention I'm working well with groups and so forth and so on. By grade six, we'd moved from the uh, rental house on Kipling Avenue to uh, 26 Grove Tree Road in northern Etobicoke, an area called Thistletown, uh, also a.k.a. Rexdale. Uh, we lived in an odd area. It was a cul-de-sac that emerged from uh, Kipling Avenue goes up a hill called Sand Hill Road to connect with Grove Tree, and uh, it branched out in, eventually into two arms. They were all executive homes, very high-end at the time, not like the bridal path or something, but just of that nature, sort of executive homes. This is my grade six report card from Albion Gardens Public School. Uh, it looks okay, mix of A's, B's, and C's in effort and achievement, but in desirable habits, I was uh, uh, a Heisman Trophy winner. Grade 7 was spent at uh, Thistletown Middle School, or Senior Public School, which was located on uh, Albion Road, south side of Albion Road, east of Islington. Marks in grade 7 were a mix of A's, B's, C's, and even the odd D. And reading the teacher's comments initialed by the principal, oddly enough, uh, they weren't thrilled with my performance. Grade 8 report card. Again, a real mix of... Uh, marks, A's, B's, C's, D's, and uh, 
I'm a, being accused of uh, gold breaking. But I did get through grade 8 and moved on to grade 9 in September 1963, just in time for the Beatles. My final marks in uh, grade 9 were pretty mediocre, uh, with a couple of exceptions. In French, I was at 55 out of 100. And in record keeping, which I guess was part of the business and commerce stream courses I was taking, uh, I dogged out at uh, 54 for an overall average of 65.6 and got a pass into grade 10. Back in the day, high school uh, was set up differently than I think it is today. You could p Going into grade 9, you could pick a stream. You could go into science and technology, which might be a two-year course or a four-year course or even a five-year, no, four-year course. That's the uh, top end. Or you could go into uh, business and commerce, which again would be a two-year drill or a four-year drill. Or you could go into the third, which was the big one, the arts and, I don't know, leisure <laughs> category. And that... You could you took five years. You had to go to grade 13 to get your diploma. I started off in business and commerce thinking it would uh, teach me about business, but it turned out to drill you on how to become a secretary, which was actually worked out really well uh, because uh, one of the big courses was learning how to type uh, using the QWERTY keyboard. And I, as you can't read this, but I think I got uh, 32 words a minute to, while maintaining... 98% accuracy, and that skill uh, was a valuable one in years to come. So my grade 10 uh, report card ends up with an average of 69.3%. Amazing how they get down to those decimal points. Uh, again, pretty mediocre, but in French, I got 42, so I guess that's called a failure. Uh, and in uh, history, I got 90 so there are glimmers of hope. My grade 11 report card shows uh, some uh, glimmers of light. Uh, in history, I got an 84. In math, I got an 80. French was a dog at 52. The mathematics uh, teacher was uh, Mr. Doug Kilner. I came to work with him years later uh, when our uh, Paz crossed. He was no longer a teacher. He was the vice president of Orlando Corporation, a big developer of industrial and commercial lands in uh, Mississauga and elsewhere at the time. Grade 12 report card. Once again, uh, French is a dog. Fortunately, I didn't have to take it in grade 13. Uh, and uh, everything else is uh, pretty mediocre except uh, architectural drafting. I got an 85. Commercial art, 64. To get uh, admitted to university back in the day, everyone had to write uh, um, scholastic aptitude test, SAT, uh, that uh, Ontario puts together. I got uh, 95. I was in the 95th percentile on verbal, whatever that is and 74 on uh, mathematical skills. One summer, I uh, rented the uh, IBM Selectric uh, typewriter, electric typewriter, for the summer. Uh, I was intent on writing the great Canadian novel. I got up to about page 80 and then just ran out of steam. Uh, I didn't know where the plot line was taking me, so I gave it up. But I still had some weeks to go on the uh, on the rental of the uh, typewriter. So I started doing stupid stuff like this, uh, trying to convey jokes using uh, letters printed off on the uh, electric typewriter. So here you see... Uh, uh, one guy down in the bottom right-hand corner, his initials are FBI, everybody else in the room is KKK, and the, uh, the caption is, Charlie, do you have the feeling one of us is different?
this is a plus sign and an asterisk having a conversation about uh, the figure eight. This is a hash mark and a percentage sign talking about a plus sign and a minus sign. The observation is somehow I don't think they'll get along. An open parentheses symbol and a question mark talking about a uh, forward slash. Here is an equal sign and an at sign talking about uh, a shepherd of P's and Q's. This is a fraction and a plus sign talking about a string of percentage signs. I wonder if I had that right or did I mean to say they're septuplets? Two semicolons speaking about a colon. First term grade 13 report card. I'm a dog in biology and the comment is unsatisfactory effort. Thank God I ditched French. Grade 13 second term. No, final term. Dog dart. There's an explanation behind that. Uh, we were told you didn't have to attend class until the teacher decided it was time to attend class because nobody was showing up with the first policy. Uh, and if you didn't show up, if you missed three classes, he'd knock 10% off your grade. So that's how I got to uh, uh, from 86 in semester one down to 54 in my final grade. Mathematics A, I have no clue why uh, I dogged that one. This is my spring uh, first year university uh, report card, straight B, so that was good. This is my uh, spring second year university report card, more or less uh, uh, mediocre, except for computer science. I got a D plus in my final grade. Uh, there's an absurd story behind that. Uh, uh, at the time, I had, my uh, high school girlfriend, girlfriend was uh, in my computer science class. She didn't have a clue how to deal with uh, computer science. And uh, at, uh, at the first exam, I allowed her to look over my shoulder and copy the answers on my exam into her exam. She did this by sitting a row above me in the uh, exam room. The computer science professor uh, remarkably identified that uh, two uh, examination uh, papers resulted in exactly the same number of correct answers and incorrect answers. It was an objective test, you know, check the boxes kind of thing. And this uh, resulted in him calling my girlfriend in before me asking her how this could have happened, and she denying any uh, wrongdoing, and then calling me in, putting the same question to me on the basis of, did you cheat? And uh, I was allowed to say uh, no uh, without lying because I didn't cheat. I aided and abetting and abetted cheating. In any event, uh, he bought into uh, the girlfriend's uh, story and not into mine, uh, and uh, I got a very poor result. As I recall, I got like a 52 or something on the result, and she got like a 78. In any event, the end of the computer science uh, course was a big project. You had to choose between uh, three scenarios, and you had to put a computer program together that answered the question for each scenario, whichever one you chose. This could be done uh, collaborating with other students, or you could do it on your own. Because of my experience with the uh, previous exam, I decided to do it on my own. And I chose um, one topic of the three. I uh, did research down at the computer science li li library at uh, U of T on College Street. Uh, figured out how to structure a program that would uh, achieve the correct result and then uh, started to program it. 
We use Fortran. Uh, at York University, uh, there was a terminal that connected with a mainframe computer in uh, Montreal at McGill, and that was how you would uh, run your programs. In order to uh, run a program, you had to punch computer cards, paper cards about the size of a, uh, an airline ticket uh, back in the day. Uh, punch out your program, run it through uh, the terminal, uh, run it through the mainframe, you get your result back. Inevitably, there were punching errors. My girlfriend had no idea what to do with the final project. She was imploring me to let her be a collaborator on mine, but I was leery, but then I thought, ah, what the heck. Uh, and uh, her job was punching out the cards that ran the program I designed. I got a D in my final grade in computer science. She got a B. I uh, had a meeting with the dean of the computer science staff uh, and uh, said, this is bullshit uh, and so forth. And uh, the mark was raised to a D plus. As a result of that, my girlfriend got into honors business administration in after second year. I was denied that opportunity and was so pissed off, I went to law school. So this letter confirms that after uh, due consideration and investigation, the Sherlock Holmeses at uh, York University raised my computer science mark to D plus rather than D. When I was in an undergrad, uh, I lived in an apartment. My uh, my family had at uh, on Warrender Avenue in uh, Tobacco. That's at the southwest corner of uh, Kipling and uh, Eglinton Avenue. It's a long drive to York University. At the time, I had a Volkswagen. Uh, you get up there, you need to park. Unfortunately, uh, parking costs money up there in that day. I uh, forged a uh, parking decal and stuck it in the window of my uh, Volkswagen and an alert uh, security guard uh, spotted the fraud and I was charged five dollars for illegal uh, use reproduction of a decal. <laughs> so these are my far final marks in uh, third year undergrad leading to a Bachelor of Arts degree. It was a B average overall. Back in first year uh, university, I took a psychology uh, course, and uh, amongst other things, the uh, professor was uh, beefing up his own uh, academic credentials, and uh, he had us all uh, complete a uh, uh, an objective uh, test of some sort that was intended to determine our aptitude for particular professions. You can't tell from this; it's very difficult to read these things. But somewhere on here, uh, law is shown as uh, uh, a profession or an occupation, whatever. And uh, my rating on that was pretty close to uh, 100%. I used this in my application after third year or in third year university, applying for law school after third year as uh, a consideration in granting me uh, uh, the invitation to join a, a, a law school. These are my uh, spring 1973 law school grades. Uh, generally, nothing to uh, remark on. The overall average is C, but you'll see in criminal law, I got a D. Interesting story behind that. Um, at the time, uh, I had an on-call job as a substitute teacher for school boards in the Toronto area. So they'd call you up uh, in the morning uh, at like 6.30 to say, can you show up at this particular school? I always uh, scooped up those opportunities because as uh, students have for generations uh, been short of money and it paid really well. Like back in the day, you uh, be paid something in the order of $150, $175 for a day, which was uh, great money. Unfortunately, uh, that meant I had to miss some classes. And with criminal law, it meant I missed a class where we received a whole new uh, paper 
on a particular aspect of the law. I was working with the uh, course materials curriculum that was uh, provided to us at the beginning of the of the course. Anyway, when we showed up for our final exams, uh, I started chatting with my uh, fellow students, and they started talking about uh, drunkenness as a defense, which was not in our original materials, and I found out there was this new paper. I went down to the bookstore, bought the paper, and then started reading it before the exam. Well, guess what? The final exam consisted of three questions, one of which was on drunkenness as a defense. So I'm sitting there writing this exam, reading the paper, trying to figure out what the hell the answer is. Anyway, I got a D. These are my final law school marks in the spring of 1975. Nothing to write home about, but my overall average was a B. And that led to my Bachelor of Laws degree, subsequently converted into Juris Doctor.